It's a real pleasure to uh, here at the World Creator Summit uh, to be here with uh, Jean-Noël uh, Tron, uh, the CEO of uh, SASM. So hi Jean-Noël and thanks for joining me on the show. How's it going today? Hi, thank you very much. Uh, just great, you know, the weather is nice in DC and we are just with friends and family from the, from the, not only in the music industry, but you know, every creators in the world because CZAC represents more than 3 million creators and it's a, it's a unique worldwide organization that we need to build on. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very interesting organization and, and one that people should know more about, uh, I think. And uh, so let's start uh, talking about the, you know, the, one of the big news of SASM in the last couple of months, uh, which is the fact that you reached a deal with YouTube. And so I wanted to ask you right off the bat, you know, are you happy with, uh, with what uh, came out of that? And uh, uh, what, what benefits do you think will bring to, to SASM members? Well, yes, we are very happy. Uh, by the way, over the last 10 years, we have signed uh, hundreds of uh, licenses with uh, online services, whether it's about streaming or about downloading. Um, and we are here to give access to our repertoire. This is what our members want. So you're right, we just signed two very important deals, one uh, with YouTube, the other one with the mother company, with Google, who's, yeah. as you know, just about to launch some new very important uh, product and services for their customers, because Android is, and soon will be in about a billion devices in the world, so that's key. Um, it's true that in some ways it has been described as a, a historical agreement for uh, for a society because it covers more than 120 countries in the world. Uh, it's not only a deal for all the SASM repertoire, and you know we represent more than 100 and 400,000 creators in the world, but it's also a deal we made for our partners of Universal Music Publishing International and for all their Anglo-Saxon repertoire that's covered by the deal too. The benefits for our members is very simple. It's to give them a better share of the value created by YouTube thanks to the advertising revenues that YouTube derives from having music videos on its uh, on its websites. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And so, uh, talking about uh, the importance of digital for SASM. Uh, I was very uh, struck this morning by your remark that uh, you know the, the digital uh, revenues of SASM uh, actually m most of those are not derived from online services but from other areas. So can you elaborate a little bit as to uh, what constitutes uh, digital revenues for SASM right now? Sure. It is true that in Europe we have some um, way of creating value that does not exist, for example, in the US. Um, one is what we call private copy levy, which is a very, very good example of how copyright, how the right of authors, has been always on the move. Uh, at the beginning of the 1980s in Europe, following the German example, Europe adopted almost everywhere, the only exception being, I guess, UK and maybe Ireland, a provision in which they created an exception to copyright. Anyone can copy at home on any device. At that time it was analog, like videotape, yeah. and today it's any digital device, like you know your tablet or your mobile phone, but can be also your USB drive. And those industrials who manufacture these devices and who get enormous benefits from the possibility offered to the consumer to copy, they have to contribute to the creator's industry. Altogether, this account for about 70 million US dollars for the same revenues. On the French market, altogether, this private copy levy account for about 200 million euros, so roughly, I would say, 240 million USD, yeah. which is less than, you know, 2% of the revenue of this industry. So it's really harmless against what of the what some of them are trying to say. The second stream of digital revenues, knowing that the question is where does this revenue come? This is what we call them digital revenues because these are digital players, of course. So the second stream comes from the internet service providers. Why? Because in Europe and especially in France, um, in France the cable industry is weak and uh, almost 40% of the households get TV through IPTV provided on an ADSL line. Yeah. And so 
these ISPs have, of course, to contribute through author's rights, so copyright revenues, and this account for roughly um, 50 million USD. So this accounts for 80% of our digital revenues. And then we have, of course, the online revenues coming from every kind of services, from Deezer. Spotify to Deezer, from iTunes to YouTube. And this represents roughly um, 27 million USD. It's, of course, growing fast, but it yeah. is less than the total. 20% of the total, yeah. knowing that altogether digital revenues represents around 14, 14% 14 of our revenues at the same. Yeah. yeah, sure. And looking at, uh, you know, at Medium, you were talking about uh, how collective management systems are for you, uh, you know, the most effective way forward for creators. And because, of course, of the, the huge amount of power required to elaborate all the data and, and create the reports and, and, and you know, make, make sense of everything that comes mm -hmm. back to you through uh, both digital and analog services. So uh, uh, how important is it for uh, the European societies to uh, be able to uh, negotiate as, as one entity, for example, SASEM retains all, all the rights around uh, uh, that particular license that you, that, you, that you issue and how important is it uh, for this setup to be like that as opposed to perhaps the US where uh, publishers can decide to take away the digital rights or do different things? Well, uh, everyone has to remember that at the core of this phenomenal model of collective management because we are a collective society. We are a known for profit organization. We are run by our members. Yeah. I'm elected by a group of authors and songwriters and publishers. Um, at the origin of it was a very simple idea that when you are an author or a songwriter, how successful that you can be if you are alone, you're weak, you know, that's exactly like in any other kind of business, whereas something is collective, you know. You're a farmer, you have making milk. If you want distribution or, you know, big uh, manufacturers of yogurts to offer you some kind of fair price for your products, you would better regroup with your fellow farmers' neighbors. Yeah. And that's the model of every collecting society. The rules has to be in solidarity between the members. And as you know, all over Europe, we have something called exclusive assignment, which is that as a creator, as a publisher, you can perfectly choose to manage your rights yourself. No one is obliged to be a member of the society. And if you want to join a society, you can do it wherever you want. Some French important composers are members of other societies. And at SASEM, we are very proud, I must say, to have about 17,000 members that are non-French for 160 countries in the world. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is, is a society able to simplify the life of music users? Yeah. And what music users ask is to be sure that they can negotiate for the biggest repertoire that they can have access to. Yeah. And this is definitely the virtues of the model. Yeah. Def definitely this is what uh, differentiates possibly the, the European market and many other markets in the world from some other markets that what, what's happening uh, in the US. And I think it's a really tough time for creators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was in, in, impressed today by so your rebuttal of uh, some uh, perhaps uh, sweeping generalizations that, that do happen uh, quite often in this industry, talking about sort of uh, how perhaps uh, uh, societies or other members of the music industry are stuck in the past and how they need to embrace uh, technology and, you know, very sweeping generalizations on, on, on how the industry is not moving forward. But of course, you, 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 you come from a business background in, in technology and so of course you, you, you don't stand for that and, and you want to make sure that people know that as a society you are a forward-thinking organization, right? Well, yes, I think we all try to do, and all my colleagues from all societies are doing the same. So, no, what I'm impressed, you know, I've been in this industry, I mean, the music industry for only a year, and something that really surprised me is how this industry is underestimated itself. Yeah. You know, the music industry tends to think that 
they have to apologize for something. But mm -hmm. gosh, when it comes to the digital revolution, and as you said, I started my career working for the computer industry. Then I moved into the information system industry, and then I work to develop the internet in France for five years. And, and, and then I've spent five years with a major telco. Uh, I was even the CEO of the mobile operations of this telco in France. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that on all cultural industries and content industries, the music industry is the first one which really embraced the digital revolution. Everyone from you know, authors and songwriters to major publishers or labels are today fully thinking in terms of being digital. So this is also the reason why I'm so straightforward in saying to some of our friends from you know, regulators, politicians and some other industries, stop lecturing us. You know, we've been striving hard to make it possible for everyone, every digital player to have access to all repertoires. Yeah. Today, any consumer can have access for free to millions of music works legally. So there is really no reason why today people should, you know, criticize uh, society or our industries. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Looking at the technology sector, uh, has the relationship with uh, uh, music startups, uh, um, how has it evolved and has it uh, uh, gone better, for example, in the last uh, three or four years? Uh, and of course, one of the homegrown examples in, in uh, uh, France is Deezer. So, so how, is, how has that relationship evolved for you? Um, first of all, I want to say that all these players, uh, whether they are Europeans or Americans, uh, they really are partners for us. You know, yeah. we had a few months of uh, tough negotiations with uh, our partners from YouTube, but we made a deal. And uh, I mean, we had all this discussion in, in good faith and the goal was to have a deal. Um, I was in, in, in LA and in San Francisco in Mountain View uh, uh, two months ago, and I spent hours with key players of the industry, newcomers also, you know, from, from Grace Notes to YouTube and from Google to uh, Zephyr, which is a, a very dynamic uh, startup that was created to uh, manage rights online and I'm impressed of course by by this um, dynamism but I'm almost more impressed by the fact that in Europe where we don't have the key players like you know Apple or Amazon or, or Google the only worldwide class digital player we have are Spotify and Deezer. And this is a lesson to be learned by Europeans, yeah. which is that the fate of the digital industry in Europe rely on the content industry. And we should be proud of that, which is not often the case in Europe, you know. <laughs> and this is also something we try, myself and many of my colleagues, to change. Make the people understand what the reality is, which is that we... I mean, we, the content industries in Europe, we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, GRD project, the Global Repertoire Database project, is kicking off in earnest uh, this year. And, you know, they're going to start setting up uh, actual offices and hopefully it's going to start bearing some results uh, by 2015 or so. So are you optimistic about the project and, and uh, do you feel like it's a necessary step for the industry to take? Oh, definitely. I hope uh, it will be a success. Uh, because uh, the industry needs to find um, new solutions to improve the way we manage data altogether. And as you know, the GRD was established for that. And the same has been at the origin with some of our colleagues uh, in pushing hard with uh, publishers, digital service providers, and also creators uh, to make this project uh, start. When it comes to what will it be, you know, I started my career with uh, uh, Anderson Consulting, you know, now with Accenture, so I tend to be always very cautious on big IT projects. Yeah. But so far, um, I guess we are on tracks. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much.